Bismillah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. You're listening to immunology lesson on immune cells and organs. We've got two learning outcomes. First is for you to be able to provide an overview of the immune system. And secondly, if you see immune cells or tissues or organs in the literature, you can recognize them. So those are the outcomes we're looking for. When you start studying the immune system, the first thing you'll realize is you can't point your finger at a specific organs in our body and say, yeah, that's the immune system, because the immune system involves the majority of the organs in our body, if not all. So think of the immune system as the whole set of cells and tissues and organs. They all work together to defend the body against harmful entities, including pathogens, um, cells like cancer and toxic substances. And that immune system can be classically divided into innate and adaptive immunities. Um, around the time when I was doing my PhD, a group of immune cells called innate lymphoid cells became more prominent. Uh, the reason it was a big deal is you can put them under, under both the innate and adaptive categories because they don't express specific antigen receptors, but they seem to retain immune memories. So they have the characteristics of both. So what I'm teaching you here, the differences between innate and adaptive um, what I'm teaching you here is an oversimplification. The line between them is blurry, right? So keep that in mind. The first difference is that the innate immunity is generally less specific than the adaptive. It means that the innate immune system doesn't recognize the target pathogen specifically before they attack the pathogen. On the other hand, the adaptive immunity does it needs to recognize the pathogens specifically. Secondly, most of the components of the innate immunities are readily available. They are preformed, meaning they are already formed before we encounter the pathogen. So unlike that, the adaptive immune response is only fully activated after we meet the pathogen. The third difference is uh, the innate immunity generally don't memorize uh, the pathogens that they fight against. So in contrast, the adaptive immunity has quite a distinctive immunological memory. So, and because of this memory, it becomes better at attacking when it fights the same pathogen again. Another thing you'll notice as we go further into this course is that certain cells are more active in one sort of immunity over the other. For example, you, you're going to see a lot more macrophages, um, uh, neutrophils when you learn about the innate immunity. Uh, and you'll see a lot more T cells and B cells when you learn about the adaptive. And of course, uh, some cells will show up both in innate and adaptive immunities. All right, before we go on, I want to give you a warning or maybe an encouragement or both, I guess. And that is you're going to hear a lot of scientific names for immune cells and you're going to hear a lot of molecular markers of those cells. And you're going to feel at times that they are muddled in your head. You'll feel confused when you feel that don't give up. Because honestly, in practice, you don't need to remember all of them perfectly because your PhD or science job later will narrow them down. You just need to fully understand some of them, maybe even one of them based on the hypothesis you're working on. All right, now to start with, you must know these three types of cells in our blood. Erythrocytes or red blood cells, platelets, who don't have nuclei and useful for blood clotting. And the most important type is leukocytes or white blood cells. Okay, the next point I want you to learn is that all these different types of cells, they all come from the same progenitor, the same ancestor. They were all once the same type of cells. 
we call them pluripotent stem cells. It means the stem cells can become any other cells. Now, stem cells, if you study current advances about them, you're going to get goosebumps because of the potential of cell customization, especially when paired with CRISPR technology. So this is where we can reprogram patients' immune cells, for example, to accept transplant organs, which would otherwise be rejected, or to even grow pediatric organs, like we can grow children's heart or lungs to replace the damaged ones so the children don't have to die. So yeah, subhanAllah, it's a, it's a mind-blowing area of technology. Now for the rest of this episode, you're going to hear about key immune cells. And don't worry, I'm not going to dump on you everything we know about each cell. Um, as a science educator, I believe that damages students' relationship with the study material. Um, instead, I'm going to just introduce a bit about them, like introducing a character. Like if you aren't familiar with Marvel Cinematic Universe, I'll be like, okay guys, this is Loki. He is Thor's adopted brother and he is difficult to trust. That's it. I'm not going to go through Loki's variants or the fact that he's dead but not dead because of the endgame timeline. I'm not going to overwhelm you with details here. I'll keep things simple to get you started studying on your own. And then for each cell, if you want to learn more, you study our reference textbook or any immunology textbooks really and reinforce them with uh, scientific articles that you can find online. All right, here we go. The first group of immune cells you should know is phagocytes. These cells, phagocytose or eat uh, pathogens, uh, they also eat damaged cells. So what happens is when you cut your hand, for example, uh, that area becomes an entry point for pathogens. So phagocytes will be called to defend that area and they will ingest and kill the pathogens through phagocytosis. Two main phagocytes are neutrophils and monocytes. And among those two, neutrophils are more abundant. If you're healthy and we profile your leukocytes, we're going to see over half of it are neutrophils. Neutrophils are crucial in acute inflammation, like when you get a cut, like I mentioned just now, neutrophils are our rapid tactical units. Their production is stimulated by two factors, GCSF and GMCSF. So um, granulocyte colony stimulating factor, GCSF, and GMCSF is granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. So both of them are just glycoproteins that can trigger neutrophil productions. And one weapon system neutrophils have that monocytes don't have is called neutrophil extracellular traps or nets. So nets are made of um, chromatin or DNA and protein complexes. So neutrophils launch these complexes out of them, out of the cell. They use the nets to trap pathogens. Beside neutrophils, you can also find monocytes in our blood. Um, when they get to the tissues, they, are, they, they can change into macrophages. Uh, macrophages can come in two versions at least. One is roaming macrophages. The other one is fixed macrophages. The roaming macrophages, they travel around in our lymphatic system, for example, usually in monocyte form. On the other hand, the fixed macrophages, they stay in one place. They stay in certain types of tissues and they have different names de depending on where they are located. The way we identify monocytes is by looking for their cell markers. If you find markers called MHC class 2, CD11B and CD86, then you know you've got yourself a monocytes. Monocytes and macrophages do a number of things. First is phagocytosis, of course, but they also act as sentinels, meaning they help detect pathogens. They also do aphrocytosis, which means they can, so they catch dead cells and destroy them. 
and they can be APCs or antigen presenting cells, which I'll talk about in future episodes. Another group of immune cells are mast cells, basophils, and eosinophils. We group them together because they all have cytoplasmic granules, which are, um, think of them like small particles that look like grains, like plant seeds. And we find those um, granules inside the cytoplasm. And secondly, uh, these three guys are often on active duty when we fight helminth or parasitic infections and in allergy. For mast cells, you'll find a large number of them in our skin and mucosal epithelia, uh, which is those soft surface inside our body, like in our trachea. One of the key granules that they release is histamines, and this stuff causes inflammation. So if you've got excess inflammatory sim symptoms, when you have an allergy, for example, your doctor might prescribe you antihistamines to stop it. It has high affinity to IgE. That means um, mast cells has a receptor called FC epsilon R1, and that receptor likes to bind to antibody called IgE. But even without IgE, mast cells can still act as sentinels to detect pathogenic substances in our tissues. Basophils have a lot of similarities to mast cells in terms of how they look structurally. They have been shown to interact with IgE, like mast cells, but they represent very, a very small part of our leukocyte population, so we're not sure what they do exactly. My educated guess would be um, they, might, they might have played a crucial role against certain types of parasitic infections that our ancestors had that we don't have anymore. So, so today, they're still around as remnants of that immune defense. Yeah, but I can't be sure. We don't know much about them. We do know more about eosinophils. Um, they use their granules to attack cell walls of parasites, punching holes in them with peroxidase or other lethal granules. To help eosinophils to mature, they need certain cytokines like GMCSF, interleukin-3 or IL-3, and IL-5 to signal an attack to, to fire away their granules. They use receptors for IgA and IgG. They also have receptors called TLRs or toll-like receptors. Dendritic cells or DCs can be found in mucosal epithelia and in parenchyma, which are the functional tissues of our organs. So because DCs can be found on those epithelia and organ tissues, they serve as sentinels, which means they detect pathogen so that our body can start our innate response. Or they also serve as APCs though, as antigen presenting cells. So that's part, so that's a part of adaptive response. I'll teach you about APC later. For now, just remember that you have at least four types of DCs. Classical type, you found them in epithelial generally. Um, you've got plasma cytoids DCs, which are important for antiviral response. You have monocyte-derived DCs, important in tissue inflammation, and you have Langerhans cells, which is important in skin infections. And then we have lymphocytes. These are the major, major force in our adaptive immune system. Their antigen receptors are clonally distributed. Um, we'll learn more about what this means in future episodes. For now, just Think of it like this. If you have two lymphocytes, both, both of them can have totally different antigen receptors on their surface. And because of it, even though both of them are lymphocytes, they cannot attack the same pathogen. So the lymphocyte that can attack COVID-19 corona cannot be the same as the one attacking other viruses like Ebola. Right? So that's the implication of clonally distributed antigen receptors. 
Examples of lymphocytes are B cells and T cells. So a subset of B cells include follicular B cells, marginal zone B cells, and B1 cells. Examples of T cells, we call them CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cells, which are the, the cell markers we can detect on their cellular surfaces. And the last group we'll learn today are natural killer cells and cytokine secreting innate lymphoid cells. So these guys are similar to T cells morphologically, but they don't have T cell antigen receptors. You can find them in blood circulation and lymphoid tissues. Natural killer cells can kill damaged cells or infected cells in our body. So in that regard, they are similar to a subset of T cells called cytotoxic T lymphocytes or CTL. And innate lymphoid cells seem to produce cytokines similar to T helper cells. So these NK cells and ILCs are similar to T cells, not just morphologically, not just in their shapes, but functionally as well, the way they behave in our immune response. Okay, I'm going to stop here for now. Go through our textbook while listening to this episode again and again to get yourself familiar with these cells. Uh, talk to you in the next episode. Barakallahu alaykum wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.